Sorry, guys. Uh, thank you for waiting. Uh, sorry, guys. Thank you for waiting. We are going to start uh, right now. Uh, Bula and warm Pacific greetings uh, to you all. My name is Apeli, um, and uh, I have been uh, assisting uh, Pina and EJN in coordinating this series of workshop uh, titled Strengthening Reporting on uh, Oceans in the Pacific. Uh, in the interest of time, if I could kindly ask uh, everyone to just uh, rename yourself on Zoom if you have not. Uh, just put your name and uh, the organization you're representing. Uh, since we will be skipping introductions altogether, uh, we could just know like uh, the participants that are currently on Zoom right now. Um, and just a quick, uh, a quick brief of uh, uh, what happened in our first session. Uh, we've uh, kick-started the first session on uh, Monday, the March uh, of March 28th. Uh, we had Dr. Angus Friday, uh, Dr. Catherine, and uh, Marisani from uh, the Office of the Pacific Ocean that um, helped us understand more on ocean management and an introduction into the blue economy. Uh, we also had uh, Stanley Simpson. Um, who came to share more about challenges the Pacific Island journalists face in, re in ocean reporting. Uh, one thing that really stood out for me uh, when Stanley presented was about the interest, uh, that there's a, a need for more interest in ocean reporting, especially reporting on uh, uh, grassroots uh, women in oceans um, and, uh, yeah, grassroots women in oceans. Um, if you would like to know more, or if you missed out the sessions uh, from Monday, uh, I did send out a link uh, just before the uh, Zoom started. I sent out a link. We've uploaded the session um, onto the EJN uh, YouTube. So you could uh, rewatch uh, the sessions, Monday session from there. Uh, with regards to today's session, I will hand it over to Imelda from uh, Internews, uh, and she will brief us into it. Naka. Uh, Vinaka Epeli, can you hear me? Can you hear me, Epeli? Yep. Can hear okay. you loud and clear. Thanks, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm uh, Imelda. Uh, senior coordinator overseeing um, internews earth journalism network projects and um, activities in the Pacific. And thank you for coming to this uh, virtual workshop on um, ocean reporting. Uh, through this workshop, we hope to build the capacity of local journalists and um, media outlets to, to raise public awareness of um, need for um, ocean protection and sustainable um, marine management, as well as um, uh, cultivate uh, a sustainable network of Pacific journalists um, knowledgeable about the challenges um, uh, and solutions to protect and uh, conserve the ocean. Uh, and um, just to let you know that an additional story grant uh, uh, program to support this uh, workshop or the workshop participants, uh, we're also providing that and um, journalists from all over the region, uh, particularly of course, those who are uh, participating in the workshop are welcome to uh, apply and uh, pitch uh, stories and the best pitches will uh, receive funding and mentorship to help uh, develop their um, uh, ideas into quality stories. So this series of a workshop is being organized by um, Internews Earth Journalism Network in collaboration with the Pacific Islands News um, Association and of course with the support from the Wait Institute. Um, again, welcome and um, over to you, Epeli. Thank you, Imelda. Um, oh, okay, so we have our first speaker with us here present. Um, our first speaker for today is uh, Langi Poiva, Langi Poiva Jackson. 
Uh, Langi Poeba Cyril Jackson is an independent Samoan journalist who has worked in the Pacific media for more than 10 years. She's currently an editor of Environment Weekly and the Samoan correspondent for the New Zealand Herald. She's very passionate uh, about viewing international environment law and policy from a small island developing state perspective. Uh, she's also an award-winning environmental journalist and has been recognized by the U.S. State Department for work in empowering uh, women through the media. Um, I'll give this time over now to Langi Poeva Sirel Jackson, uh, if she could. Hey, Feli, thank you. You can hear thank me you. okay? Um, yes, can hear you perfectly. Thank you for your time and for agreeing to present. First time, Taro Falava, everyone. Um, it's always a great pleasure to present to our Pacific journalists, most of whom I've had the pleasure of working with before, and most of whom are actually really amazing journalists who have been reporting on not just oceans, but on environmental issues. So I feel a bit shy. Uh, somewhat to report to the like to to do this presentation with the likes of Lisa in the room, um, given that you know there is expertise uh, in reporting on oceans already. But nonetheless, I've been invited uh, kindly by EJN and Internews, as well as the Wake Foundation and Pina to make this presentation. And so therefore, um, it's my pleasure to be here. Just to note, Epeli, uh, I spent 20 years reporting, not 10, but it is nice that you think I'm that young. <laughs> um, and currently, I am corresponding for The Guardian and The Economist. Uh, and I do still run Environment Weekly just to capture some of the environment stories from around the region. So if you can just give me a yes that you can see my shared screen and I will go ahead and start. Okay. So covering ocean stories in the Pacific. Um, and so I have uh, 15 minutes, Epeli, or? 15 minutes. Okay. So covering store, ocean stories in the Pacific. So I always like to start with a compelling photo uh, so that we can kind of reconnect to where we come from and the oceans that have raised us our, and our ancestors and make us essentially who we are today. So I wanted to share this photo, really compelling photo, given the fact that we are living in COVID times. And it was taken by a Samoan photographer, Sone, um, who just captured this a young man with his mask on, and it was during the first week of the mask mandate. And, you know, he is obviously in the ocean. Um, and a lot of people ended up using the ocean and, you know, for pleasure and for sustenance um, and in daily life in Samoa, uh, you know, during the lockdown. So I wanted to use this as an example of a very compelling way to tell the ocean story. Um, because essentially, irrespective of what we go through as Pacific Islanders, the, the ocean is always there for us. So my first question is um, to our participants is, what is the Pacific Ocean story? Um, and how do you define that for yourself uh, as a Pacific Islander, um, as your own nationality, as a Fijian, as a Cook Islander, as uh, Nivanuatu? You know, what is the Pacific Ocean story for you? Because this varies depending on where we come from and depending on the values that we place on ocean resources and on um, the coastal areas. And it also depends if you live uphill or by the coast. And then the other question you have to ask in telling an ocean story is, who tells that story best? Because often we go to politicians, uh, we go to scientists, yet there may be other sources that could tell that story better than those usual sources that we go to. And then there is the question of when should you tell that story? Is the, is the ocean story 
the, a story that we tell every day that can be told any day? Or is it a story that we only reserve for when we've got no other news to speak of? Or when there is an oceans workshop or you know, a big conference that everyone's attending from the government? You know, that's always an important um, question to keep in mind when you are you know, planning your coverage throughout the year or throughout the month or even in that week. And then what visuals best represent that story? Um, I'll come to it later, but often you, I've seen amazing coverage of a scientific, say, ocean-related story, um, yet the photo that accompanies it doesn't really complement um, the story itself. So just some initial um, highlights of coverage that I've seen so far recently, um, not recently, but on the website of we have here Fiji Times on the left, um, and then on top is Samoa Observer, and just below is Solomon Star. Um, what's interesting about, I just want to do some commentary on this. What's interesting about the coverage by Fiji Times here is that initially I thought that headline was G named Ocean's Champion. So the headline was not really clear. Um, but I felt like that was a good story. And that that sort of, with this story, I feel like it's a missed opportunity that Fiji Times could have utilized the photo of the AG by the ocean. I know for a fact there's quite a lot of photos of him, especially around the time of Ocean's Conference. Um, and also some photos of him on one of the canoes. So, you know, just marrying the, the headline to the photo, to the story itself. So that's that's an opportunity I felt could have been strengthened in this particular coverage. Um, on the Samoa Observer one, I do really like the, the chosen photos for each of the stories. Um, and of course, using the Forum Fisheries uh, DG is always a good idea because she has a very um, a compelling, it's compelling visual, so to speak. That middle photo that they used from one of the cliffs um, out on the south side of the island, um, it's always good to use those type of landscape photos to match with the with the headlines. But that one is about Australia, so perhaps they could have, um, you know, put in their photo uh, from Australia as well. Potentially, could have been an option. Um, and then we have the the coverage below from Solomon Star. I noticed that most of the ocean stories that they featured were actually stories from other countries um, or a press release, but nevertheless, it's still ocean stories, which um, still adds value. Um, did you want me to look at the questions or is that something we'll come to later? Okay. Uh, we will have the question and answer sessions uh, right towards the end. Okay, great. Um, I wanted to leave a lot of time for that so we can have discussion and also like to hear some ideas from the rest of the participants. So these are just my impressions of some initial coverage that I looked at. So in terms of tips on reporting on ocean stories, my favorite, my personal Personally, myself, I like to cover stories from the community. So I like to go into the villages and interview the locals. Um, and one of my favorite pieces recently was on fisheries and how it affected um, local communities in Samoa. So really getting the stories directly from the people um, on how impact of the impact of climate change on oceans has changed the way they, they live or their lives and how this impact um, not just the economy, but the way of life in that particular country. So I would advise seeking out ocean angles, just not waiting for the ocean story to come to you. So a good example would be if you look at the, the waste, uh, health waste produced as a result of the, of the pandemic, you know, there is an ocean angle there in terms of pollution um, and how our government's managing that waste. Um, looking at the types of masks that are utilized, is there a, a waste management plan for the waste as a result of the pandemic? 
So, you know, there are always ways to use, to utilize um, angles of stories, mainstream stories, and make it an ocean related story. So I also like to, to suggest that you find sources on oceans um, in the community, at the national level and global level. So the upside of this approach is that when you have a local story that the national sources cannot comment on, you can go global. Um, and then if you have a global story that you need to localize, you can go to the community leaders. Usually you have the NGOs and you have the chiefs and uh, women's representatives at the village level who can perhaps provide a different angle to a story and add a little bit more nuances, especially to a global story. Um, know the science, just like climate reporting, know the science and the politics of the ocean story. Um, for example, with the Oceans Conference, uh, there was a lot of politics surrounding the hosting of the Oceans Conference and representation. Um, at that time, as a reporter focusing on oceans, it would be good to like know who makes certain decisions um, and how they come about those decisions. In respect to the science of oceans, understanding the science gives you a lot more breadth on the types of coverage you can, you can do. So understanding the science means that you can understand the nuances of the of ocean science, and then you can explore issues further um, on the ocean story. So for example, microplastics is a big issue in relation to oceans. So understanding how that is treated um, within the region and nationally would give you additional news angles on covering the ocean story. I also like to really um, focus on the cultural understanding of oceans because that's a story that cannot be told by anyone else but us, in, you know, in our own country. So your own understanding of the value of the ocean. There's something ringing. I apologize. Um, so there's always you understand the value of the oceans to your culture and your community, and therefore understanding the science means that you can build on that knowledge and improve your, your news coverage um, in that way. Um, there's also using visuals and informative audio uh, to inform the story. That's always, with, like with any other co uh, coverage, it's always good to use compelling uh, visuals and informative audio um, as needed. So. Um, recently, we worked on. Uh, I worked on a project with the Guardian called "The Impossible Choice," and it was a series of podcasts. Uh, and we interviewed um, people in Tuvalu, Papua New Guinea, Marshall Islands, um, and Kiribati. And we utilized the the sounds from the spaces where the sources were talking from, and it really improved the quality of the of the podcast that we were producing. So I would advise for, especially for the radio and TV people that, you know, you utilize um, the local images and visuals. Because sometimes we do get lazy and use a lot of archival footage um, and as well as uh, photos when we can always build that up by updating the imagery that we use. Um, so that's all for tips from me. I would love to hear uh, what everyone else thinks, and I'd love to open it up to discuss some of the things that I've raised here. But before we do, I just wanted to end with um, by highlighting the work of Mark Membre, who keep Membre, who is from Samoa, from Savai, from the island I'm from, and I think I see him in the room. Um, so Mark has recently taken on climate reporting in Samoa, but what's interesting is that he has been using the ocean angle as well um, in this story. So he hasn't just limited it from, um, from the climate perspective, but he's also expanded it beyond the climate narrative. Okay, well, that's it from me. I would love to discuss further. Um, Ifili, will you be facilitating the discussion?
or not. Okay, um, Lisa, if I can call on you, uh, if you're listening, um, to share what you think would be the best approach to covering the ocean story from uh, your, your perspective as a Fijian journalist. Hi, Sherelle. Um, I think uh, you and I are pretty parallel in the way we, oh, sorry, excuse me about that virtual background. I think you and I are pretty, uh, pretty parallel in the way that we um, decide how to approach things. But um, I think for the most part, I, um, I rest on the fact that I'm, a, I'm, a coast, I'm from a coastal community and I grew up in the islands. And so I always try to think about what's relevant for the people who still live that life, you know, what's relevant uh, for those who are dependent 50% or 80% of the time on the oceans. Eh? And so I really liked your, um, your pointers at the start about choosing pictures that are powerful and relevant, being intentional about the kind of headlines that you use. And you're absolutely right about the story about the AG eh? and that they, they could have used a different picture, but then they went with a picture that told of a different story. And so it might turn people away from what, it, what is uh, possibly a really good story about good work that he's doing. Uh, but as, as I listened to that, I also um, drew on my newsroom experience a little bit and realized um, sub editors or, or photographers don't always have the time eh, to be able to get the perfect picture. And so it kind of drove me into a space to think about, well, how do we do that? How do we address the um, difficulties that exist in the newsroom so that the good stories that we as reporters write uh, get accompanied by good pictures, get placed in a good place on the, in a good space on the, on the page that it does justice to the story that we're telling. Um, but to answer your question, uh, Sherelle, I always think about what's relevant to the, to the people that um, this story is meant to serve. Eh? what's important for them, what cuts at the heart of what is critical in their daily lives is, is usually how I decide um, to go when I cover an ocean story. Thank you, Lisa, and I didn't mean to put you on the spot there, but I appreciate how you are. I know you're doing resilient stuff and you're now intersecting on, on the two. Um, totally agree with you. There are dynamics within the newsroom that prevent the effective coverage of climate, oceans, and, and resilience and other issues. But, you know, where, and I also know that as editors, um, editors have the final say, so you can be as passionate a journalist as you want to be, but if the editor doesn't prioritize that, then, you know, uh, you've just wasted your time. So that's another dynamic that's beyond the capacity of the journalist. Um, yeah, we'll move to Priscilla. Along the same line, um, so what kind of uh, time frame are you looking at when reporting, especially if we're going to do like, um, you know, go deeper into the ocean reporting stories, like really in-depth stories. Um, so what's a realistic um, time frame? Thank you, Priscilla. Of course, it's dependent on your workplace, on what outlet you, you are writing for. Um, so for myself, if I'm working on a feature that takes a bit longer and the sources are not um, immediately available, I will have it in the back burner. And because I work for dailies mainly, it takes me about maybe a week or two depending on the availability of the experts or those I need to speak to. Um, again, this is really dependent on the type of story, the depth of the story that you want to explore, and how comprehensive you want to cover it. So I, I imagine with TV, if you're working on a longer piece, it will take longer, um, also dependent on the availability of the sources. Um, if I may, <laughs> um, also regarding the photos, those are really beautiful photos. Um, so what kind of uh, tip or technique would you advise us? Like what kind of time of day or uh, 
what kind of day to go out and do those um, shots because those are those really look amazing and that's what you know reporting is all about the pictures really tell the story um, so <laughs> yeah that's my question thank you Priscilla well you know um, there is a golden hour right but I'm not a professional photographer and that golden hour is you know occurs at sunset or sunrise so to speak um, the photo that I've used there is from a professional photojournalist in Samoa, so he has a lot of experience and he has great equipment. So just so we're, you know, we're all aware that it does take special circumstances and resources to get that type of imagery, and not all newsrooms have that. Um, you know, and sometimes we have to depend on our phone cameras. So also, like, just be realistic about it. Uh, I also advise that there's a lot of NGOs who take beautiful imagery and having um, contacts with those NGOs who work in your community, they can perhaps uh, assist you in sourcing high, um, you know, really good uh, photos for ocean related stories. Um, and you can also like there's a recommendation here for a photo stock. Is that Oh, keep a stock build. So from Lita, keep a stock, build your stock of images. Agreed. So over time, you know, you can, so that photo that I shared, I actually saw it on Instagram and I knew the photojournalist. So I reached out to him for his approval and he shared it with me. Um, so also just be aware of who takes good photos and perhaps assign them, collaborate with them so you can have that element to your story. Uh, thank you, uh, Langi Poeva uh, and uh, thank you everyone for such an engaging first uh, part, uh, first half of the segment. Um, unfortunately, in the interest of time, we need to carry on. Uh, we will have Q&A sessions towards the end, and uh, if uh, you would like to ask any other questions, uh, you could ask it then, but also, um, Yes, uh, interesting um, uh, comments shared and questions shared about uh, what is a Pacific Island story for you and who tells uh, the ocean story best, whether it's the people or it's the science. Um, great points that I picked up was knowing the science and the politics. And uh, while you understand the science and the politics, you learn to tap into the cultural understanding aspects of uh, the oceans. Uh, thank you again uh, for your time. Uh, we will move on to our um, social media workshop sessions now that will be delivered by um, Amrita and Hannah. Uh, just a brief uh, introduction about Amrita. Amrita is the EJN editor and content officer. Uh, she is a multimedia journalist and editor with over 10 years experience reporting on food, agriculture, climate, and the environment with particular focus on South Asia. Um, she is a former story guarantee of the EJN and her three-part audio series documenting the impacts of climate change on Nigerian communities in mid Himalayas was long listed for One World Media Award, which recognized underreported stories from developing world. Um, so Amrita um, was also previously part of the editorial teams at Nature in Focus, a platform for wildlife and conservation stories in India, BBC Good Food, mean newspaper to name a few. And she's currently based in the New in New York. And also um, joining Amrita will be Hannah, uh, also from Internews EJN. Uh, she, Hannah, is the program associate for EJN. She works to build EJN's outreach efforts globally through social media and other digital strategies. She's currently based in Orlando, Florida. Uh, Mula, and welcome, Hannah and Amrita. Thank you, Ifili. Thank you. We're really excited to be here. Um, I'm going to share my screen and we can get started. So. Um, like mentioned, we are going to be talking about social media. Um, there's a lot to say about social media, and I'm sure many of you um, also have a lot to say and a lot of good tips and tricks for each other. 
So we're just hoping to dive into it. And um, a lot of this may not be new to you. Some of it may be new to you. We're really hoping to give you some new ideas and strategies and things to get excited about digitally in the future. Um, so like said, I'm, I'm Hannah, I'm EJN's program associate and I run our social media along with Amrita. Um, so, and yeah, we're really excited to get started. So we wanted to start kind of with the basics and talk about why social media and other digital tools can be really important for journalists to build your following and kind of what those positives are that social media can bring. Um, of course, social media is all about connection. So making connections both inside and outside your region. I think this is a really cool opportunity to broadcast what you're doing beyond your community um, internationally or regionally. And you can also network with people who have shared beats or interests, people you may not have met otherwise. You can also find story ideas, sources. You can seek out editors, media outlets to work with. You can promote your work and build an online portfolio so people know where to come to look for what you're up to. And you can also demonstrate your expertise and build a brand, which we will be talking about a little later. So for journalists, that's really just some of the ways that you can operate on social media. Yeah, and increasingly that's becoming more important, both for people who are on staff um, at legacy outlets or up and coming media outlets, and also for freelancers. So because journalists are using social media more to demonstrate expertise and build their brand, as Hannah said, it helps editors sort of, it's an easy way for editors to also see what, what your areas of expertise are, what beats you report on, what your interests are. So I want to sort of briefly run through this from the perspective of what the editor might look for, um, whether you're a freelancer, you know, who's pitching an outlet or whether you're looking at getting a grant um, and sort of why they would access your, your sort of platform. And so as Hannah mentioned, you know, you're sharing your work, so they get more access to your past work. And also they're seeing who you follow, you know, who your network is, what kind of reach you have, uh, what kind of stories are you sharing that aren't yours? So what are your interests, you know, your passions? All of this, I think, just as journalists like to know more about an outlet and an editor, will also like to know more about the journalist. So it goes two ways. Um, and I think often as journalists, we, we, we overlook that bit. Um, and the other thing is that it, it's sort of more and more um, a sort of marker of how proactive you are. If you've, put it, if you've reached out to an editor through social media, you know, if you've, you've done your homework, you know a little bit about the outlet, you ask questions. Um, all of these I think are big positive signs. And so we're really curious about you and what you use social media for and how you use it, whether it's for personal reasons or for work or a little bit of both or something else. Um, so we wanted to try this interactive question tool called Mentimeter. Um, at the top of the screen, it says the instructions, you just go to menti.com, M-E-N-T-I.com. And then there is an eight digit number code that you put in and then you'll be able to um, send us your responses for what you use social media for. Um, and this will just help us inform our presentation and understand a little bit more about where you all are coming from and um, how you use social media. So we'll take a few minutes. We're gonna do a few of these Mentimeters throughout the presentation. So the first one might take a little getting used to if it's a new platform for you. And if for whatever reason it's not working for you, you can put something in the chat too, that's totally fine. Um, I see connecting with people around the world is showing up on the screen, which yes, I also really enjoy using social media for that. Um, and yeah, following experts, <laughs> memes, me too. Advocacy, cool. These are great answers. Daily posts, that's commitment. I don't even daily post, that's awesome. Events, learning relevant news and information. Yes, me too. There's some really interesting studies about how news gathering has shifted to social media instead of often traditional news outlets. Sharing, keeping track of trends, data. 
the work, connecting with sources, reaching a larger audience? So I think, yeah, those are the ones we're going to focus on in the, the time that we have, connecting with sources, reaching larger audience, and even how to potentially keep track of trends. Oops, sorry. So, yeah. My, there we go. Of trends and topics in journalism. So, mm -hmm. and connecting. So, yeah. Yeah. This is supposed to scroll, but as we can see, it's not quite scrolling. But um, these are all really great answers. So thank you for sharing. Um, all right. So that's exactly what we're going to dive into right now is what can you do on social media? And from your responses, I can tell a lot of you already do a lot of these things. Um, but like I said, we're really hoping to uh, leave you with some new ideas, creative ways to be on social media. So that's what we're going to dive into now. Starting with a really easy one, which is just introducing yourself. Um, I know whenever I set up a new platform or even just with my current platforms, I'm always rewriting my bio. Um, so I wanted to give some tips about some things you could consider, including on your bio and your profile for a variety of platforms. Um, just the basics, like a clear photo of yourself can really help people find you and identify you, especially if they know you in person. Um, also the region or country and city where you're based so people know the geographic area you report on. A brief description of your interests can be really helpful for people who want to connect with people with similar ones like uh, one of our uh, grantees from India, Mahima, has listed gender, environment, health, science, and culture as the topics that she's reporting on. If you're a freelancer, you may want to share where your bylines are, where you've been published, or if you're a staffer, the name of your media outlet and also tag them if they have their own outlet um, handles, I mean. You can include contact information, good for tips or work inquiries, people who wanna work with you. Um, and then another cool thing is a pinned post. Uh, on Facebook or Twitter, you can pin posts, um, you know, pin your favorite story or pin something you want people coming to your profile to see. You can also save highlights and stories to your Instagram. Um, and one that I really like and that EJN uses is a link in bio tool like Linktree or Tap Bio that can allow you to share lots of links with lots of different people. Um, so these are just some of our some examples. These are mostly journalists in our network who are online um, and what their bios look like. I think some of them are cool and interesting and different and still include some of these elements. So I really like how they made it their own. Um, okay, and so the next thing, once I think that you're happy with how your bio is, hopefully you, you've sort of taken a second look and seen whether it's sort of, you know, whether there's tweaking needed. Um, I think then a lot of what journalists want to know about social media is how are we going to find story ideas on our beat? How are we sort of going to use this for leads and sources, right? So there's probably so much that we can sort of just discuss together in this room but a few that I think we wanted to highlight today are Twitter lists, which are sometimes overlooked. So you can go to your suggested lists on Twitter, or you can sort of search for a topic and follow lists where there are either scientists or sort of influencers, for lack of a better word, or people who are sort of experts on a beat. Here I've given two examples. Um, where you sort of get both sort of news and new research plus access to experts all in one packaged way because then those um, people on that list sort of their um, tweets or whatever appear on your newsfeed. So lists are really important but often overlooked. Um, and then I think something that we do do more frequently is sort of just reach out, reach out to our network, ask questions, ask for people to help you amplify, retweet. So here are a few examples, you know, questions. Um, I'm doing some research on a story. Does anyone have specific examples? So I think probably we can say that we're more familiar with, with this aspect. Um, another good thing to do is to consider what hashtags you're following. And this is across platforms because, um, Although I think like for virality, the issue of hashtags is sort of up in the air. Um, and But I still think they're valuable in terms of accessing information and sort of filtering what you want to know. Um, yeah, uh, I think also news sites, as some of you mentioned, you all are following current events to get story ideas. Um, and yeah, I think at this point, a lot of this is something that we're all doing. 
but we could potentially be more proactive in how we're doing it and use sort of all of these powerful tools at our disposal. And the other thing you can do with a lot of those strategies Amrita just mentioned and a couple more is find sources. Um, I find it really helpful to use the hashtag like journal request, which is pretty active on Twitter. Um, I use it in terms of, you know, journalists can tweet and I can tweet into it and use the hashtag, but I also sometimes just browse journal requests and then I add a keyword of whatever I'm looking for, journal request ocean, journal request health. And I'll find other people looking for sources or scientists offering their expertise. And I can also kind of figure out, okay, who else is covering this? Are there journalists I could talk to or, you know, chat about this beat? So this hashtag on Twitter is a really good way to both find community on your beat and also find sources. Um, and you can also use just plain keyword searches without the hashtag. Twitter has a really powerful search engine and I find it really helpful if I want to find a tweet that uses the words ocean and health in the tweet. You know, I can use Twitter to do that and I can find experts that are talking about it, maybe that are sharing new research or um, journalists that are sharing stories they've written that I can read to keep up to date on the topic. Um, and then outside of Twitter, I also pay a lot of attention to groups, Facebook groups, especially reporting on issues that affect local communities. Sometimes there might be a Facebook group where those community members are all participating in a discussion of some sort or a WhatsApp group where everyone is talking about it. And so engaging with them and um, being present in those spaces can be a really good way to find sources. And again, here are some examples. Someone's looking for a marine biologist, someone is looking for someone at the intersection of climate change and gender. So, um, and there is a really good article from IJNet about how to use this hashtag and give way more examples. So I've linked that at the bottom here and everyone will have access to this presentation after the workshop. So you'll be able to check that out. Yeah, um, so we know that editors um, or grant giving organizations often sort of share calls, opportunities, um, you know, they say they're open for pitches, often that's happening more on online, you know, and so it's, I think, a good time in our little session here to talk about once you reach out to an editor, how do you sort of streamline that interaction and make your pitch as powerful as it can be. So I think we all have sort of various viewpoints depending on the kind of outlet we work for, kind of region we're in. But I think what we're trying to do here is really look at best sort of practices according to us as EJN who see a lot of pitches coming in from every region around the world and coming in from very early career journalists to very experienced journalists. So a couple of things that I think um, apply across the board um, would be, what does your pitch have to do? You have to sell your editor on the story, right? So which means you have to go and build it out to beyond just a subject um, or what we call a topic. So like, you can't just say, I want to talk about um, mangrove degradation or climate change, right? It's too broad. So what is the character? What's at stake? What's the conflict? How is it a narrative arc? Do you, can you lay out what the beginning, middle and end of the story might be? That's a story idea with a strong angle. But that's not the only thing that we have to do, right? We also have to think about how we're selling the editor on ourselves. So why are you the best person? That's often overlooked. Um, it's not because you care or you're passionate. Um, I think you need to be much more specific about it, which is how does your pre-reporting show that you've done the right research here? And how do your past sort of work samples sort of tie in to showing that you are capable of producing a very strong story? So I, as specific as you can be, I think that's a strength. And that ties into the next point. Um, how does your story sort of fit with what that outlet um, typically, typically produces? Um, is their coverage sort of in line with what you're proposing to them? And how is your story different from all of the stories out there? So often we get um, a story idea where the journalist sort of struggles to tell us, you know, what they're doing that's unique or different and what their reporting will uncover that we don't already see. And I think even though it's a pitch, show what your sources are for the facts and figures that you cite. Um, there, that it's just always better to be cautious and link link to everything, every stat that you're using. Um, if you're using a quote, say who you got it from. Um, 
I know we definitely like to see that, you know, there is sort of a attribution there and it's bolstered and we, I think, trust the journalist's ability to then go out and do a full story on that. You know, it doesn't matter so much what past stories you have, as long as I think your pitch is strong. Um, and then here again, this is subjective. So I will say some editors do like a longer pitch. Some don't want even more than two sentences. But a sweet spot is typically about three to four paragraphs. Um, you'll be detailed enough, but you won't be sort of sharing your full story um, at, that, at that level. And then again, one thing that we notice a lot is we see the journalists sort of talk about themselves and about the, the editor or the outlet, but what about the audience, right? So which, what kind of demographic, what kind of audience are you writing for? And can you show in your pitch why they should care and why should they should care about the story now? So I think these are some sort of helpful, hopefully helpful tips that will improve your pitches, whether it's to an outlet or for a grant. And the next bit we're going to talk about is what you do once you have that story, once you're working on that story, um, and what we like to call it is building buzz. Um, and this is one of my favorite things to read and look at on social media is EJM's grantees talking about um, the work they're doing on assignment, where they're going, pictures they're taking, you know, a really interesting interview they had as they're working on the story. Um, so these are just some examples of grantees talking about, you know, glimpses from the field. Um, I really like this work in progress stamp on Instagram, sharing photos with us. Um, and they, they often tag us and I love sharing that stuff to our social media. And the reason that I think this can be really helpful is it's a teaser. It promotes you as a journalist and as a person and makes people think, oh, that's a really interesting quote. That's a really interesting story about this expert that they interviewed. I'm gonna come back and read the story. You know, it puts them, um, ready to go for that story you're going to publish. And it also gives you some day in the life. It humanizes you. I think social media can feel sometimes very one-sided and like you're not talking to anyone um, sometimes. And so sharing those experiences, you know, someone sharing something interesting they heard on a AR6 um, United Nations press call. Um, so sharing this day in the life moment can be a really interesting way to bring people into your sphere and to share with them what you're up to, aside from just sharing the link to your story. Um, and um, in the next session, I think Tiffany is going to go over this a little more in detail. Um, and the last thing, of course, is when the story is published, you have to share your work. Um, and we really love Twitter threads and sort of long form Instagram posts because they can provide more context, behind the scenes details, experiences that you had covering the issue that doesn't make it into the story. Or maybe you have some video clips or audio or photos that didn't make it into the published story that you share on social media as one of our grantees did here. Um, or maybe there was a really interesting nuanced thing you're reporting on and you wanna dive into it in a thread and really get deeper into it. Um, so those are, here are some more examples of that. Um, and those are all things that can boost your profile more than just sharing the link to your story and allow you to take it farther. So those are just some um, things that we really like to do. So before we move into this sort of last section of the workshop, um, our session, I think that the takeaway here is that we need to sort of, as journalists, use these platforms to communicate about our stories, our work, our sort of interest areas, our expertise, and not sort of wait for the outlet to just do that promotion for you, um, to share your story, or, you know, whether it's a newspaper or, or whatever it is on whatever platform, I think we need to take more ownership. And so how do we do that? by expanding our own reach and how do we talk to that audience that we're growing? That's kind of the focus of this, this little section here. And so to think about that, um, I want you each to think about your own brand on whatever social media platform that you use right now. Are you consistent in the way that you share? you know, whether it's to network that you know or to a wider audience. Do you think that you are, that you know how you'd identify your voice or your tone or your style? And so it's kind of muddy, right? Like it's a slippery concept to, to be able to tease out what this, each of these is. But I think we can understand 
um, we typically want to pick one or two from each section. Um, and this is just basically based on communication experts, guidelines, um, you know, organizations use this and also individuals. So um, I'm gonna give an example based on the kind of tone and voice and style that I think I might use. And then Hannah's going to move on and talk about uh, what EJN as an organization uses. Okay, so I would say my voice, um, cooperative, observant, I'm hopeful that it's one of those, I'm, I'm aiming for those, uh, very sort of friendly, um, thoughtful, um, I'm aiming for casual and simple in the style that I'm sharing. Um, I don't want to feel like I'm alienating anyone or, or trying to talk down to anyone. So those would be, I think, something to think about where you are building this voice of yours and then you own that over time and to a wider and wider audience. So they know what to expect when they come to you. I think that's important. That sort of sets you apart from all of the other sort of people out there that they're listening to. You know, I know whose tweets are gonna sound like what, essentially, that's what we're going for. Yes, um, and we'd love to know what you might think about your personal brand. This could be one that you're currently using, the way you currently operate on social media. It could be something you aspire to or something you'd like to institute in the future. Um, so this is another mentee. So the, I'm not, I'm not sure why it's displaying like this, but <laughs> um, there is the mentee.com and then the um, number code again. Um, so I hope it's working. Let me know if, if something is funny. Feel free to also put it in the chat if you're having any trouble um, accessing Menti. Um, and feel free to take a second to think about it. Um, I'm just going to check that it's working. I don't know that it's coming through, Hannah. Do yeah. Do you, has, has anybody sort of tried and it's not shown up on the screen? Of course, I tested it several, several times, but okay, okay, I've got it. It's showing up on Mentimeter, so I'll just, um, we'll just look at it on here really quick. Um, Ah, there we go. There we go. Not sure why it wasn't working on the PowerPoint, but that's okay. Um, I really like these factual, poetic. I like that one a lot. Candid, friendly. Timely is a good one. Mm -hmm. Informative. Yes, informative, as I'll discuss in a second, is also one of EJN's brand words. Um, awesome. Okay, well, I think I'll dip back to the presentation. Um, Of course, now it's working. Now it shows up. <laughs> All right. Um, cool. Oh, I saw some more. Ooh, down to earth, inclusive, organic. These are great words. Motivating, relatable. Relevant. We get them. that's a good one. I really like organic. I hadn't thought of that one. As an adjective in, in that way. And I think that's really nice. Natural. Cool. All right. In the interest of time, I'm going to move on, but um, this was really fun. I love the word bubble effect. <laughs> so, um, as Amrita mentioned, um, I'm going to quickly talk about um, EJN's brand and also how that manifests. So, what actually it means to embody those words. So our adjectives are approachable, friendly, and informative. Um, and I do several things to make that happen. I use a lot of emojis, first of all. 
Um, I'm a big fan of the thread emoji and the down pointing emoji, as you can see in this example. Um, I also ask a lot of rhetorical questions because I want to bring people along in the discussion that I'm having or the topic that I'm exploring. Um, and I also speak to the audience directly. So I write in second person and I say you um, a lot. And when I say you, I'm speaking to journalists since that's our audience. Um, and I also include humor when I can, when I think of a good joke um, or a lot of personal comments. I like to respond to grantees posts and congratulate them on a job well done or an award that they've won or just to tell them I liked the photo that they posted because um, I find that that really helps make us an approachable organization. We want to be an organization of people, a network of people and, and not just kind of a faceless, a faceless account. So um, this is one thread that I did recently for Women's History Month um, and International Women's Day that exemplified some of those things. And um, just to dive really quickly into some audience building tips. Um, there's a lot more than we can cover here. And these are just some ideas to kind of get, um, give you some new ideas. But a big thing is consistency, both with brand and also with how often you're posting. Be active, be around, retweet, repost, be a present in Facebook groups. And also lean into reciprocity. And what I mean by that is post other people's work and see if they'll post yours, post colleagues' work, especially that you admire share stories you love, but you didn't write. It turns you into a resource. It makes you a source for information aside from just your own stories. Um, and then another thing is curating who you follow. What I mean by this is making sure you're following people that make your feed be a meaningful place. So find the accounts of people you admire. And then like on Twitter and Instagram, follower lists are public. Go through who they're following and just follow them. You know, follow people back when they follow you. And don't only follow institutions. Institutions tend to follow the people that work there. So check who works there. You wanna follow a United Nations account? Okay, dig through their followers and find their comms officer who could maybe help you out in the future. Um, a couple other ideas, um, some journalists I know like to create a Facebook business page or professional account on Instagram, kind of separate from their personal account. I think it's a personal choice, what people are comfortable with, but I think it's a cool idea to kind of build your brand separate from any personal social media use you want. Um, and also build relationships. Social media should be a two-way street and have conversations, compliment people on their work, reach out, communicate, um, and make that a conversation online so that you know you can build that network organically. And there is so much more that we cannot cover today. Um, we've already talked for way too long. Um, just a couple things here that we wish we could cover that we would love to cover in the future is things like Twitter Spaces, the new audio platform on Twitter, newsletters mobile journalism, social media graphics and explainers, going live on Instagram or Facebook by yourself, or it could be cool to join with a colleague, also short form online video like Reels and TikTok, and also of course, YouTube and podcasts. These are all really other great other tools for social media that we cannot get into right now, but luckily we have a whole resources slide that has tons of links and articles about how you can read more about all of these things. So this is our last mentee. Um, I hope this one is working, cross my fingers. Um, we really want some feedback, honestly, on this presentation. We wanna know, did you know everything that we were talking about or was something useful to you? What stood out as something you might wanna implement um, and or something that was new to you that you might uh, wanna start doing? Um, we're, we're curious if um, our tips work for you or if um, they're interesting. Finding interesting people to follow on Twitter. Yes, I spend a good chunk of my time doing this on the EJN account and I always find it fun to find new people and learn about new things. I'll give it like one more minute. I know this is kind of a bigger question. Um, feel free to put it in the chat too, if you like. Uh, 
Is it all showing up on Menti or is it coming on the slide? Okay. Um, there's one on the slide and then I see parents put in the chat the introduction part. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I'm glad that was helpful. Um, in the interest of time, I'm going to keep going, but um, thank you all. Oh. Oh, it updated. Oh, good. Mm -hmm. We're all here. <laughs> we're a little new to Menti, if you can't tell, so we're <laughs> just getting used to using it. Um, setting the tone. Yep. Tone. Um, improving the bio. Following right, the right people in institutions, interesting people, doing more threads. Cool. Yeah, um, I think I see one of that is one of those is a question, and we will get to questions after uh, the next presentation. Mm -hmm. So yes, how much of your yeah. informal practices, business page? Great, Hannah. I think we have a minute left. Yes. So the rest of the presentation is just a bunch of resources that you'll have access to uh, with the presentation. So we have free tools you can use for social media ideas of accounts. These are international accounts that you can dig around their follower list to find people interested in things you're interested in. Um, and then also a bunch of articles about different social media topics to learn how to do things your own way, you know, pick what you're passionate about and dive into it. Um, but that's it. And we, we don't know how much time we'll have for questions. We want to answer as many as we can when we get to that point. But if we don't get to it or you want to chat separately, we would both really love if you reached out. We would love to speak to you more in depth about anything specific you're working on or anything you want to chat about. So feel free to reach out to us over email or our Twitter accounts are here as well. So yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Hannah, and thank you, Andrita, uh, for that very informative session. Um, like they mentioned, we will have a Q&A at the end once all speakers have uh, presented. Uh, and we also have the option of sharing the emails across if you want to reach out to them personally after this workshop. Uh, joining the conversation on um, uh, the social media aspect is uh, Tiffany Ngo from uh, Wait Institute. Tiffany is the uh, communications manager. Uh, she is an environmental communications uh, by profession with experience in content creation. Uh, and she has a BA in Environmental Studies with a minor in Spatial Science from uh, UC Santa Barbara, where she graduated with honors. Naka Tiffany. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks, um, Amrita and Hannah, for that great uh, first presentation. Um, so my name is Tiffany Ngo, and I'm a communications manager at the Weight Institute. Um, so my presentation today will focus on how uh, journalists can use NGOs as a resource um, on social media and for stories. And then also, um, I'm going to dig a little bit deeper into ways that journalists can use uh, social media in order to bring more attention um, to their stories as well. Um, so can everyone, just making sure everyone can see my screen, just shout if you can't. Okay. So I want to uh, start off first with a question. Uh, what are some of your favorite ocean accounts to follow on social media? So uh, feel free to type it in the chat or raise your hand. I don't know if I can see if you raise your hand, um, but if you have any ideas, um, feel free to just put it in the chat and I'll give everyone just uh, 30 seconds to a minute. Someone put Conservation International. Yeah, I follow them as well. They have a lot of really great images. IUCN is another really good one. World Wildlife Foundation. Sargasso Girl, she's the best. Pacific Climate Warriors, also a great one. Nature Conservancy, okay. IUCN, WWF again, all really great. 
So um, here are some of my favorites um, ocean related accounts to follow on at least Instagram. Um, so the first one is the Weight Institute. I'm just being purely biased here. And the second one is Oceanic Global, which is a nonprofit organization that's really good at um, condensing technical information and ocean news into very aesthetically pleasing bite sized pieces. Um, and then the last one is Only One, which is a ocean uh, media organization um, that aims to use powerful digital media to um, inspire change and activism. Um, so besides being visually appealing, uh, what do you think these accounts have in common? Um, and feel free to enter in uh, any answers in the chat. So um, what do these accounts have in common? We have one response, ocean. <laughs> yes, that is, that is correct. Um, but besides that, um, all of these accounts, they are always looking for content. So as a social media manager, probably one of the most time consuming uh, parts of this role is simply uh, trying to find content and finding interesting ocean stories that we want to share on our social media channels. So this is where journalists can come in. So I think um, with NGOs and journalists, um, they're, they can serve as a really important resource to each other and each has um, specific uh, wants and the, uh, that the other one can meet. So for example, um, NGOs want coverage and reporting related to their work. So one of the big challenges that NGOs face, and I know that the Weight Institute communications definitely faces, is that we um, do a lot of great work and we work with so many incredible people around the world, but we just simply do not have um, the time, resources, or capacity to uh, tell all of these stories in a way that would do them justice. So that way, um, journalists who are always looking for story ideas, um, they can come in and help to cover those stories. Um, in addition, NGOs are always looking for interesting stories and content to share on their social media channels. Journalists are the one who are producing, um, reporting um, on topics that would be relevant to the NGO's work and interests. So journalists can create these stories and send them along to NGOs to use for social media content. And then on the flip side, journalists want story ideas, um, which NGOs can provide. Um, and journalists want sources for those stories. Um, a lot of times NGOs um, are just a wealth of knowledge, just even just at the Weight Institute. Uh, we have plenty of subject matter experts on different um, ocean topics, such as marine protection, marines, uh, spatial planning, a uh, blue economy, sustainable fisheries. Um, and if we don't have anyone in house, uh, we're connected to experts all around the globe that we would be happy to connect journalists with. Um, and if journalists want a larger reach for their stories, um, a lot of these NGOs have really big followings on social media across all their channels. Um, so they can serve as a channel to amplify the great work of journalists as well. So this is just how the Weight Institute uh, approaches social media. And I think that a lot of NGOs in the environmental space um, sort of approach social media in a similar way. I don't wanna speak for them, but um, there are some common themes. Um, but at the Weight Institute, one of the things um, that we wanna do is amplify important ocean stories in the countries that we work, where we work. Uh, we want to elevate the voices of people doing the good work to protect their oceans. And then we also want to share um, important ocean news such as um, 
if there's an exciting new uh, report about a scientific finding related to the ocean, we wanna share that. Or if a country just created a new marine protected area, that's something uh, we would want to share um, and that our audience would find interesting as well. Um, so just looking um, at our own social media, um, we wanted to see what performs well. And again, this is very specific to the Weight Institute social media, but um, I think so some of these themes can be found just across all channels and all accounts. Um, and for Instagram, Instagram's a very good place for shareable content. It's very good for visuals. So the more attention grabbing visuals you can create on Instagram, the better. Um, some of our top performing posts, um, one of the most shared posts from last year is uh, this carousel we uh, created explaining what a marine protected area is. Um, and part of the reason why that did so well, I think just it really grabbed people's attention at first. We used um, this great underwater photo um, with big bold text to draw people in. Something else that we've noticed on Instagram is that people really like learning about other people. So anytime we share um, a photo of a person, for example, here we did a feature on Willie Koska from the FSM. Um, a lot of times people who follow us um, know the people who we work with and we feature, so they um, get really engaged in that as well. And then as for Twitter, um, our top, some of our top tweets from last year were when we announced big ocean news. So for this one, um, we announced our partnership with Fiji. Um, that got a lot of attention. And then here, um, the Tonga cabinet approved the Tonga Ocean Plan. Um, and that's great news. So people really engage with that as well. So how can journalists apply um, what we know about what does well on social media to their own stories? So here I have um, an example of a post from the organization Only One that I think really takes a lot of those things together. Um, so Only One published a story on their website about managing a marine protected area. And um, they used social media in order to drive uh, more traffic to that uh, long form story on their website. So here in this Instagram post, it's a carousel post with uh, multiple slides. Uh, so I just uh, pulled out a couple of them. But the first one, it has a really great uh, photo to draw people in. Again, the photo is really pretty. And it has um, this title, A Tale of Hope, Loss, and Resilience, which really gets you wondering. Um, and then the, for the second slide, uh, they put a picture of a person to put a face to the story. So for example, if you um, have a story and there is about a person, or you have a source um, who went on the record and that person has a really interesting story, consider using them um, as a way to draw people in. You know, people will be, people will see another person and they'll wanna know more about that person and uh, may engage more with the story. And then here um, they have, um, again, big bold text with, um, an interesting uh, bit of information to really get people thinking. And then at the end, uh, they, they end with a call to action, telling people to go read the full story um, at the link in their bio. So this is a really good example of an Instagram post um, that you could use to promote your story. So Think about uh, your story sort of like a communications campaign. So you have your story published and you want more people to read it. Um, and there are things that you can do beyond just uh, posting a link to your story once or twice, which is great, but um, it's really easy for that to get lost um, just in social media land where things are posted every second. Um, so something, um, that I would recommend is post, posting bite-sized pieces of your story to get people engaged. Um, here is something that Oceanic Global posted on Instagram that I found um, really simple 
and does not take a lot of effort at all. They simply screenshotted um, the top part of an article and overlaid it, like put it on top of a photo. Um, and this, again, minimal effort, but it really um, catches the eye. And you know, you already have your story written with a catchy headline. Um, so why not just make that, you know, go farther? Um, second point is sharing multiple posts over a period of time. Um, as Hannah mentioned in the previous presentation, Twitter threads are a great way to do this. Um, you can continuously add to a Twitter thread and um, add different or talk about different parts of your story, pull out different quotes. Um, and then lastly, make sure to engage with your audience. Um, if someone responds to your tweet with a question, make sure you answer it. If someone comments on your Instagram, make sure to thank them or respond if they're asking a question. And um, other ways that you can um, advertise your story um, in a more creative way, um, just think what is visual. So something that um, we like to do and we see as really successful in the past examples that I just showed, um, really using graphics and something that I think um, anyone can do. And again, I'm all about minimal effort um, is just simply putting um, interesting text or quotes on top of a cool photo. And you can use a free tool such as Canva um, that is um, free and very user friendly. Um, so you could eventually, you could probably make something like this in less than 10 minutes. Um, and then these graphics can be shared across Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Instagram stories. So you share like just enough um, to where you get someone's attention and you're getting them to want to know more. And takeaways and final tips um, for social media. Uh, use visuals whenever possible, and you can always have a big reach with low effort. Um, make your social media posts more shareable. Uh, make sure you tag people. So um, again, when I mentioned NGOs being a resource, and in Hannah's, Hannah and Amrita's presentation, they had a huge list of um, environmental organizations to follow. Look at those people. Um, look at, you know, if any of those organizations, um, if your story aligns with their content and you tag them or you send your story to them, they might just retweet and share it because they're again, they're always looking for content. Um, don't be afraid to experiment and try new things. Social media is always changing. Um, it's changing at a very rapid pace um, and there's trends emerging every day. Um, don't feel pressured to jump on every single trend, but don't stop yourself either. If you see something fun that you think aligns with you and your personal brand, uh, don't be afraid uh, to jump on. And lastly, have fun. I think social media is all about having fun, which is why I like my role as a social media manager. Um, and think about the content you find most fun and engaging and apply those aspects to your own social media. One example um, that my last example that I'll give um, about big reach with low effort. Um, when Instagram, Instagram Reels and TikTok came out, I was a little bit intimidated because um, I'm not really good at editing video. But I thought, you know, um, what, what kind of content do I like to see? Well, one, I have a short attention span and two, I like listening to good music. So what I found that was low effort, but big reach, um, we already had a wealth of, um, video clips in our files. So I would find visually appealing clips from, from 15 to 30 seconds and put a good song over it within Instagram. Um, and it took me about 15 minutes, and those were some of the most um, well-performing posts um, on the Weight Institute Instagram last year. So just think about um, creative ways that you can share with people um, content, but don't kill yourself and spend way too much time on it because again, social media is meant to be, um, still meant to be fun. And finally, um, if you have any questions, um, I love to answer them. If you have a story that you think um, 
fits into the Weight Institute or you would like us to share it, feel free to send me an email um, or you can also um, follow the Weight Institute and message us on one of our social media platforms We're on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. But um, if you have any questions about social media or ever just want to chat about any weird social media trends, feel free to drop me an email too. I always love talking about that. Naka Tiffany, um, we will jump right quickly to a question that was posed in the chat. Uh, and if we could kindly ask either Amrita or Hannah to uh, answer that question from Seneti Popua, if you've seen the question. You're muted, Amrita. <laughs> of course I am. At least I wasn't muted during the presentation. Small, small victories. Okay, so I think we'll both take them. Um, those were both great questions. Uh, I think the first one, if I recollect right, was um, Vox Pops when you reach out on social media and you have sort of anonymous accounts, right? Um, okay, so I think you still need to follow sort of journalistic standards in the sense you need name or name age, depending on your outlets requirements. Um, so if it's an anonymous account uh, or, you know, you're not certain that you can verify the identity of the person, I don't think that it holds um, as sort of including it in your story. But I will say that if you want more information, use the this garnering, garnering um, you know, soliciting information, use that as a first step and then say, hey, can I email you and then follow up? So it's not the final step, but it is a way to like cast a white net. Um, that is my, Hannah, do you wanna add to that or should we move to the next question? No, I, I have the same answer as you so we can keep going. Okay, yeah. Do you wanna start with the next one then? Um, yes, so there was also a question at the end from the same person, I believe, about coping with negative social media engagement, especially for beginner journalists. I really relate to this. I've had some really tough experiences online. Um, I'm sure many of you have also dealt with things like that. And I think something that I realized, you know, I work in social media. So in addition to being on social media in my free time, I'm doing it all day at work. And I would just say social media is not everything. Um, and again, my advice here is not a quick fix. Social media can be a really powerful negative and positive tool, but I have just learned that it is not everything and that sometimes I just delete all the things off my phone and I go for a walk with a friend and it cannot be my entire existence. I can't spend hours looking at comments and responding because all it will do is fuel the little monster inside me that says nasty things and, you know, so I think that that's the advice that I was once given that I find really helpful is that you can turn it off. You are not obligated to respond to trolls or people that are saying negative things about your work. And another thing is you should speak to your editors. Um, you should make sure that they're backing you up, that they're supporting you. You should speak to friends or um, other people that can support you and help you vent and rant it out. Um, but ultimately turn it off and walk away and walk away knowing that your job is harder than it is to type a little angry comment. Your job is hard and you're doing the work to do it right. And, you know, you don't, yeah. So that would be my, um, my sort of advice based on some personal experience. So, yeah. Yeah. I'm happy I don't... to discuss that more in depth. If anyone wants to chat over email about what's something they're going through or anything like that, I, this is something that I'm pretty passionate about. So if anyone wants to touch base on that, feel free to email me. Hannah, I just want to add one thing, though I think you've mostly covered it, especially from the perspective of like an early uh, career journalist. Um, I will say that there is a, a negative comment can also be constructive. Um, so I want to just touch on that area when that happens, when it's not a troll or someone being sort of abusive or, you know, ranting and raving. But if it can be constructive, I would say try not to be like disheartened and defensive as your first reaction. I know that that's like easier said than done, but you know, can you learn from it? And can you engage with that person who's, after all, they've taken the time to share their feedback with you. And you know, it could potentially be a moment where you don't defend and you just acknowledge, or you, you know, you figure out how to sort of address that next time in your next story. So it's always like you're building 
on you know what you've learned and I, I don't think we need to automatically shut it down when it's not congratulatory or you know always cheering you on I think it can be a learning experience as well so yeah I absolutely agree with that there's definitely a difference between someone providing constructive feedback and a troll um mm -hmm. so that's a really good point um quickly Atelier, I also wanted to address a question that came through on the menti just really quick before we move on um, someone asked how much of our presentation was informed by Pacific practices. I thought this was a really good question. So obviously, Emerisa and I are not from the Pacific, and our experience draws on our work with journalists all over the world, including the Pacific, where EJN does have a large program. And I think ultimately, you are the master of your own social media. You know what works in your community. You know which platforms your audience uses. If it's WhatsApp, if it's Facebook, if it's something else, if they're not on social media, and this wouldn't work for your particular context, so I hope that our presentation is a broad overview and you can take what works for you and leave what doesn't. And maybe something we said wouldn't work, but give you a different idea for something else you could try. So ultimately, um, yeah, that would be my answer to that is that it is informed by our work with specific journalists and also journalists in every other corner of the world. Um, but yeah, ultimately, um, we really hope you just take what, what works for you um, in, into your own context. And I don't know, if Ali, do we have time to look at the questions in the chat that have just come in? Unfortunately, uh, we have, our time has run out. Um, if you do, um, if you do have any other questions for our um, uh, speakers today, we you have to reach to our, reach out to us directly, and we will put you in touch in contact with them. Uh, we have to extend, I have to kindly ask everyone if you could extend today's session just for another 10 minutes to allow uh, the presentation by our last speaker, uh, Dr. Katie Soapi, who will be speaking on ocean science and conservations in the Pacific. Thank you again, Amrit and Hannah, for your time today and for your presentation. Uh, please just allow us another 10 minutes uh, for Dr. Katie's uh, presentation. Over to you, Dr. Katie. Um, thank you, Epeli. Uh, are you sharing it? I sent it to you. Sorry, I am traveling and I am not at my desk and I am having some issues. <laughs> so I won't uh, have my camera on as well because it's kind of upside down. So um, maybe while waiting, I can just start. Uh, Bulavinaka and... Um, Warm Pacific greetings. Uh, thank you so much for this opportunity uh, to come and share my thoughts on uh, strengthening reporting on the Pacific, uh, on the ocean in the Pacific, and how it relates to ocean science and conservation uh, in the Pacific. I am Katie Soapi. I'm the coordinator for. I'm the coordinator for uh, Pacific Center for Ocean Science. Um, and I'll just touch very briefly on what I do in the next slide. But I asked the organizers what I should talk about, what angle I should be using. And they said, oh, we left it open for you to talk about what you feel comfortable with. And I think that's the wrong answer to a scientist because I come with a science brain and here I am in a journalist meeting and feeling totally out of place and outside of my comfort zone in how to communicate you know science and I actually feel like oh I actually need training in science communication now so I can be able to you know share my uh, the science we do but thank you for this opportunity I'll try my best in uh, talking about some of the work we are doing and uh, hope that it's relevant so FPC, uh, Pacific Community Center for Ocean Science. It's a regional organization working in, uh, um, owned by 27 member countries. Uh, 24 of them are Pacific Island countries and territories. It's the region's hub for science, technology, and innovation for sustainable development and works across a number of ocean sectors. And so the Pacific Community Center for Ocean Science uh, was set up not so long ago, three plus years, to bring together the ocean science within SPC to ensure that we better uh, serve the needs of our region, especially um, 
providing easy access to ocean science and expertise that our members need for decision making uh, for sustainable development and protection of ocean resources. Next slide, please. Um, so I'll have, I'll just speak on three, three messages or three key things. One is that we need um, Pacific owned. We need to hear more stories about Pacific owned and Pacific led ocean science. Um, you know, this will, this will bring up more uh, awareness about what's happening in the Pacific. You know, these stories will um, bring more value and understanding to the science and the ocean um, work that is happening. And it also comes with capacity building as well uh, and genuine partnerships that can co-design and co-deliver the science we need in our region uh, for decision-making. And um, so that's kind of the first thing I wanted to touch on. The second story or second thing I wanted to touch on is um, that science and, and traditional knowledge are uh, complementary knowledge systems for us here in the Pacific. Um, you will know, or many of the Pacific journalists would also know that in our communities, people don't often use the science uh, because they don't have access to the science, but they have the indigenous scientific knowledge that they use for decision-making. And so these two knowledge systems, they uh, need to come together um, and that we need to take into account um, the contributions of both for ocean management and protection. And the third one is, you know, how do we work together? When I was asked to, to come and talk, I was like, oh no, I am scared of journalists, you know. Will I be able to talk about, you know, the things I do in, in layman terms or in, in language that, um, that is appropriate or will I just bore everybody to death? Uh, and you know, just just how do we bring science and and media together? And that was meant to be a kind of discussion, if there needs to be discussion. I don't really have the answer to that. Um, and I'm hoping maybe somebody like Lisa would be here to you know maybe talk a bit more about SPC's experience. But I'm not quite sure. Um, anyway, next next slide. Okay, so why do we need Pacific owned and Pacific led science? Well, you can see, you know, that we are stewards of the largest ocean in the world, the blue Pacific continent. We are 24 Pacific Island countries and territories. We have 42 million people, 42 million square kilometers of ocean space and a combined 30% of the world's EEZ. And so individually we might, you know, we, we, we might look small, but together, you know, we, we are stewards and custodians of the largest ocean. And as large ocean states, we have, um, we, we should really be, um, uh, our voices should be elevated and our stories should be heard. And so why do we, one Pacific led stories because we um, we know our people better, you know, we know the signs that they need. And we can help determine the signs they need uh, for the ocean we want as well as their development needs. Um, and to ensure that these science needs are driven by our members' priorities and not just doing science for science sake. There is too much, too many examples of, you know, parachute science that comes in and um, run a workshop maybe. Um, and, uh, and then, you know, we don't really end up with that long-term engagement. So involving Pacific scientists and involving Pacific um, Islanders is one way we can solve this. And yes, we have limited capacity, but with better training, we can do it. If you look at examples of tuna science in the Pacific, we are world leaders in tuna science, and we are able to use the science to manage 
our tuna resources very well, and it is one of our biggest enemies. And so the training that we need should be through uh, genuine partnerships um, and not just, you know, training that come in to tick a box, run a one-off workshop, give us some scientific equipment, which more of becomes more of a burden rather than um, being able to, you know, really use it for the science we need. Um, and so I'm just highlighting some of those, those challenges that Pacific scientists faced and, and why it's important for us to provide that uh, capacity they need to be able to um, do the science and lead on it as well. Uh, so that's kind of the, the first point I wanted to, to um, discuss about or talk about, ensuring that Pacific Voice is ahead, the needs, uh, science needs are incorporated into our work and take center stage. Next slide, please. Next slide. And so um, the next point is the science and uh, traditional knowledge being complementary. And I just wanted to bring in the decade of ocean science in discussion because there's some work that's starting in the decade of ocean science program that we have. So the decade of ocean science is this global framework to support efforts to reverse the cycle of decline in ocean health and create improved conditions for sustainable development. So as part of a decade call, the SPC submitted a program called the Pacific Solutions to Save Our Oceans. And this is a program that hopes to integrate um, ocean science, uh, looking at policy science and culture as a way of uh, um, balancing the use of ocean uh, and its management and protection of resources. Um, and this is a, a program that has been endorsed by the decade. Um, if you go to the next slide, please. So this, this program, as I mentioned, has been endorsed by the decade and it was developed out of uh, uh, a lot of consul consultations across the across the region, and um, basically also looking into all the ocean, national ocean policies that have recently recently been lodged, and putting together the um, the priorities of a region. I just wanted to very touch slightly on two things. One is the science. So yes, we need science, and we need you know, baseline information, but we also need the ability to be able to access this science and ability to use it for decision-making. And combined with that is the traditional knowledge and um, culture aspect of it. We have to ensure that the stories that we tell take into account cultural knowledge as, as we all know, traditional knowledge and culture is a cross-cutting issue. It's across many different themes that we, we work in. And so documenting these traditional practices and ensuring that uh, they are um, used and taken up into policy together with the science is one way we can really link to our communities, to our youth, and to our uh, member states as well. And I just wanted to highlight that because you know, a lot of times people talk about how can we save the ocean or the ocean is declining and all of that. But if you look around in the Pacific, we have some of the healthiest oceans in the, we have some of the healthiest ocean in the world, you know, and that is really due to the fact that we are still using our traditional practices to manage our ocean um, and our, our local and coastal communities. Uh, they, they use that to, 
manage their ocean resources. So I just wanted to highlight that, you know, we don't necessarily need to always look out at the science that's out there, but how best can we incorporate and capture the traditional knowledge that's out there already that our communities are using uh, and incorporating or integrating that together with the science and making that into policy, making that into uh, legislation that's useful for our communities to be able to apply and, and use to manage their resources. And on that, I just wanted to highlight a, a small um, project we've started under this program. It's called the Early Career Ocean Professionals. And this is, you know, I mean, we're looking at the decade, looking at 10 years ahead, but who are going to be the leaders 10 years from now? It's our youth. It's those early career ocean professionals. And so we've started this program of reaching out to, to some of the youth to support them in some of the work they are doing in a national ocean offices. So we have a small program in the Vanuatu office. And uh, next slide, please. Um, where we've, uh, so we've, we've started this in Vanuatu where we've got uh, five youth that are work, uh, worked in the Vanuatu uh, Oceans Office. And one of them was looking at traditional knowledge and uh, how traditional knowledge is used to manage the ocean. And I find this, uh, this, uh, this slide here is from one of the presentations that were given by one of our Elikari Ocean professionals, highlighting that at the community level, it's, you know, it's nature that's helping them determine uh, how they manage their ocean and uh, ocean resources or coastal resources. And, um, you know, they're looking at the, the time of the season, the flowers that bloom and relating that to also spawning uh, in the ocean and, and, um, and knowing when you know to go out and fish for certain, um, um, say for example, octopus or reef fish and all that. So I, I find this as a very interesting and uh, quite um, very eye-opening. I mean, I know, we all know a specific islands, these things are happening in the community, but documenting them and using them to um, complement the science is, I think, um, something that we still need to do. And these stories need to be elevated. I'm a scientist, so I'm, I'm going on and on about these things. But for, from a journalistic point of view, perhaps, you know, these are the stories that need to be highlighted. These are the stories that we need to, to bring forth to our people and not, um, not, not only about the science, which often sometimes is, as I've said, more parasite science that's not really relevant to us. And my final slide, please. Um, so what can we do? The last point. I, I, as I've said, I don't really have an answer. Uh, and uh, I uh, just wanted to share some of the work that had happened under the decade. So as you can see here, this was the regional consultation for the decade of ocean science. And um, it was held in nine, uh, 2019 where we had stakeholders from all over the Pacific. We, have, we had scientists, we had traditional and indigenous knowledge specialists, youth representatives, uh, cultural experts, including the media as well. And we had uh, the media partners were there, there was media training. Um, and I just, I just wanted to highlight that uh, out of this, this, um, um, this uh, consultation that was held, we had so many ocean stories that came out at the end of this, um, th this workshop. We had the media and the scientists all together in one area and one building. 
And during in between the sessions, media had access to scientists to tell those stories. And um, yeah, so I, I feel like this is a good way to be able to um, get those stories out. I don't know if this is the, you know, I, this is one way of doing it for, for scientists. Um, and it's, it's a good model as well, uh, providing equal space uh, for media as well as, you know, um, having open access to, to scientists. Uh, funding, of course, is a huge issue when all these things happen. So it's, these are some of the limitations. Um, and I am, I will stop there. I am, yeah, I, I, I can take questions if anyone wants. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Katie. Sorry, with the interest of time, and since we've really gone over time, we will have to close today's session over there. Um, we can, though, uh, get you to contact Dr. Katie directly at kts at sbc.int if you have any questions for her uh, regarding her presentation. Or if you have any questions for our other speakers for today, uh, please do reach out uh, to us and we will get uh, you in contact directly with them. Uh, thank you again for your time. Just uh, in terms of uh, last reminder, uh, April 4th is the last uh, session uh, for this uh, series of workshop. And uh, secondly, and finally, uh, a reminder to all participants that uh, with the support of uh, Wait Institute, uh, there's a, a $30 uh, uh, stipend for all participants that have attended the workshop. So I do hope to see you guys uh, in the final uh, um, the final workshop on Monday, the 4th of April. Good night, everyone.